And he has this great metaphor in Rings of Saturn. He's like using the silk thread. It's a metaphor for civilization itself. It's just hanging by a thread and it can snap anytime. And this is when things go really bad. All right, welcome everybody to this new video. Today I'm gonna to talk about W.G. Sebald, Sebald, and I'm going to point out his major theme of his books. Now, this video is called W.G. Sebald and the Natural History of Destruction, because Sebald sees something in nature, a destructive principle that influences everything, that permeates everything. So, in a way, he's not someone who sees nature as a benevolent force, it's the opposite. He believes that this destructive principle that nature consists of can be found everywhere, can be found in civilization, in every human being, in every living being. So I want to talk about the author himself a little bit. In the beginning, W.G. Seabold was born in 1944 in a very, very tiny mountain village in the south of Bavaria. And he died in 2001 in a car accident. Actually, what happened is, so he was driving his car and had a heart attack. And then the car just went off into oncoming traffic and he was killed. But basically it seems that he was already dead before he actually crashed with another car. So this is a very tragic death because he was on the height of his fame and people were considering him to be the next Nobel Prize laureate. So in a way it's a real tragedy because his literature meant something to many people and he was addressing problems that are of more of an essential and fundamental ontological nature too. And so W.G. Sebald is an abbreviation of course and this W.G. are his first name and his middle name Winfried Georg Sebald. Uh, he didn't like those names because like Winfried he always looked at it as kind of like a Nazi Germanic name and actually his close friends called him Max. So he was the most widely read author of the early 21st century and he was especially well received in the English speaking world as kind of like a German good guy who's really facing the horrors of German history and is kind of like, like a German good conscience writer. Now he's best known for these three books. Austerlitz, Austerlitz was published in 2001, the year he died. And then The Ausgewanderten, The Emigrants, it's from 1992. And the Ringe des Saturn, Rings of Saturn, from 1995. To my mind, his most important book is The Rings of Saturn. Basically, it's travel literature. He's walking through the English countryside and he connects all the dots of human history and the way everything kind of like forms this web of destruction, violence, and brutality. It's very fascinating. I will quote some passages later on. So this is the cover of his first book. What Sebald liked very much was to go to uh, secondhand bookstores and he would just find certain photographs and include them in his writings. So just to make it more authentic, but I mean, it's still fiction, so it's not authentic. So this kid on the cover is not Jacques Austerlitz because Jacques Austerlitz, the protagonist of his novel, does not exist. He made him up. So that's the emigrants, the Ausgewanderten, and there's Sebald addresses the horrors of immigration after the Nazis took over and so on. So he's following four people and their paths into foreign countries just because they had to leave Germany. And it's interesting because it's kind of like hits home for him because he also was an immigrant. He lived in England uh, since the 1960s and rarely ever came back to Germany. He kind of just left that it was a place for him to be. He never really felt at home in Germany and he was looking for an alternative home. So he kind of like broke with his roots, but in a way, of course he couldn't. This is why he's been addressing these specific German issues in all of his novels. So they kind of like generally t deal with one theme. It's um, leaving one's country, having to leave, and also like seeing how this principle of destruction that is prevalent in nature follows you everywhere because of course you also carry it with you because you're a part of nature. So every single human being is connected to this destructive principle. Now this is the cover of Rings of Saturn, uh, which I just said, uh, I think it's the most important book. And it's not really fiction in a way. It's kind of more like an essay, like a meditation on human history and on nature itself. So in a way, he kind of found his own unique style in this book. 
So there's basically no dialogues between characters. It's just him observing and just immersing himself in this environment and letting history go through him and make him realize how everything connects. And it's really kind of fascinating experiment because he connects the whole world, like England, English history, China, Chinese history, a typing tangle, and everything. So that seems to be totally unrelated. But in his book, it all makes sense. No, it is all connected indeed, because this world is just one single system and it is based on the same principle which is this destructive force that can be observed in nature this blind violent brutal barbaric force that creates life and also destroys it for no reason that's just the basis of life itself so he's mostly viewed as a holocaust writer and of course the holocaust is one very important motif in all of his writings But the thing is, Zebat himself had a quite unique view on the Holocaust because it was a manifestation to him of this destructive principle that can be seen in all of nature. So he cannot really be reduced to Holocaust writer per se. He also criticized the air raids carried out by the Allies during World War II that, that killed many German civilians. So he said this is also not justified. Although, of course, the Allies, the Allied forces were fighting the Nazis. But it was still a genocidal war against a civilian population. He made this his theme in his book Luftkrieg and Literatur, Air War and Literature from 1999. And it caused a huge scandal, mostly in Germany, because people said, how can you write about this in this way? It was just because it was against the Nazis. And he said, wait a minute, but it was a war against civilians. It had no real military purpose. It was just a campaign to kill as many civilians as possible. How is this moral? And people just couldn't get it. They just said, no, 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 it is moral because it was against the bad guys, basically. And he just took a lot of criticism for that. But in a way, it's also, again, the main theme of his whole literary oeuvre, which is that nature itself is destructive. And this destructive principle also manifests itself, not only in the Holocaust, but also in the bombing campaigns carried out by the Allies against the German civilian population. So what he did was actually he accused German writers of willfully ignoring this genocide. Why are you not dealing with it? What are you afraid of? Especially early modern German literature after the Second World War, like the Group 47, people like Heinrich Böll, Günther Grass, Martin Walser. And he said, you're just fake You're trying to avoid this. You're trying to score points with the audience by always making Hitler and the Nazis your theme and showing how much you regret and how evil it was. But this is just a ruse to become famous. You're just using this as a shortcut to success because you want to prove to people, I really regret all these things that have been committed by the Germans. I really, really am a moral person. I'm willing to face these horrible, horrible crimes because by this, I can show my moral superiority. And he said, this is inauthentic. It's not right. And he really, really was criticized very harshly because of that. And what he says about the Holocaust is very, very significant because, again, this is his view on the world in general. The Holocaust is just one more manifestation of this natural history of destruction. And he writes, Ich sehe die von den Deutschen angerichtete Katastrophe, grauenvoll wie sie war, durchaus nicht als ein Unikum an. Sie hat sich mit einer gewissen Folgerichtigkeit herausentwickelt aus der europäischen Geschichte und sich dann aus diesem Grunde auch hineingefressen in die europäische Geschichte. Deshalb sind die Spuren dieser Katastrophe in ganz Europa ablesbar, ob sie nun im Norden von Schottland sind oder auf Korsika oder auf Korfu. So he says, I do not see the catastrophe caused by the Germans, horrific as it was, as a unique event. It developed with a certain logicality from European history and then, for this reason, aid its way into European history. That is why the traces of this catastrophe can be seen all over Europe, whether they are in the north of Scotland on Corsica or Corfu. But to his mind, it's just one more proof, one more event in this long chain of destructive events that 
mark the real nature of nature. And so what he sees there is like this kind of industrialized extermination of human lives. He thinks this is very closely connected to the Industrial Revolution. It's like the Industrial Revolution provided the framework for something like this to happen on an industrial scale, on this level of magnitude. So in a way, there were good intentions behind bringing prosperity to society and just lifting people out of poverty. The problem is that everything can also be abused to do the opposite. So maybe the good intentions were there, but I mean, the machinery used to produce wealth can also be used to destroy lives. So it always is kind of like a quite ambiguous thing. It can go both ways. It just depends on how you use it in what kind of context. So the Industrial Revolution provided the logistic solution to many problems. And then the Enlightenment provided the intellectual foundation for modernity. And science provided the technology. So it's this unholy trinity, Industrial Revolution, Enlightenment, and technological progress, scientific progress, that lead to all these modern catastrophes with millions of people getting killed. So it would not have been possible before the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, and the Scientific Revolution that came with the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. So this is kind of like uh, the face of the modern world. So it can lead to prosperity and uh, it can lift people out of poverty, but it also can bring destruction on a never-before-seen scale. So these three parts of this unholy trinity themselves are not to blame in their individual dimension. But as a whole, when they get combined, they offer certain solutions to problems, but they also offer certain ways to bring more harm than good. So for Zebaid, it's always like this construction, destruction, they go hand in hand. They're two sides of the same coin. So it can very quickly just go the other way. There's no guarantee that things are only used to do something positive. It can just go like this, you know, it, go, it goes sideways in a heartbeat. Yeah, who knows? And he has this great metaphor in Rings of Saturn. Um, he's like using the silk thread. Uh, it's like what do you kind of like, it's a metaphor for civilization itself, that it's just hanging by a thread and it can snap, it can rip anytime. And this is when things go really bad. So this is also an image uh, in his book, Austerlitz. And this is like the birth of new stars, new solar systems. And in a way, he describes the beauty of it. So it's something new being created out of chaos. But in a way, it's also, there's also this uncanny kind of destructive principle at work because it's not going to be forever. It's going to disappear someday. So life itself, everything in this universe will not be eternal. It is going to fade. It's going to be annihilated by the forces of the universe, by the forces of nature. That's just the way this world, this universe is constructed. Sibat's project is to create a narrative of extinction and suffering. And these two principles form the basis of existence itself. Now, the problem is, how do you depict these major catastrophes and individual suffering in literature? It poses some stylistic problems. And how does Sebald face these problems and master them and solve them in his own writings? So this coexistence between suffering and major catastrophes is very important. He basically sees the macro level influencing the micro level. So it's this general to particular structure of the scenes he evokes in his writings. And in order to depict this, he uses the panoptic style. It's the panoptic schema, and he basically picks up Michel Foucault's Panopticon. And uh, the Panopticon itself provided prison guards with a 360 view of the prisoners. So everyone could be surveilled 24 hours a day. There was no way to evade the surveillance by the prison guards. No one had any privacy. Everything was seen all of the time 
all day long. So there was no way to escape the gaze of the authorities. And this is interesting because I've mentioned this in my first Hesse video. Like Mikhail Bakhtin, he talked about the role of the author and the position of the author, the place of the author, the location of the author in the novel. He's sitting in the center of the novel and has a 360 degree view of his materials. So he organizes everything and he is aware of all the parts he puts together. He's the organizing principle of his novel. And Zebad uses this to analyze history, all the catastrophes, civilization, nature, individual suffering, and all the brutalities and atrocities occurring in human history, and just to present them in this kind of like panorama of a 360 degree view on the world and the destructive principle that is kind of like underneath it, but permeates every single being of this world. So that's what he does in Rings of Saturn. He connects all the historical catastrophes in his prose by using this panoptic schema. So his novel takes him from the English countryside to the opium wars in China and the Belgian genocide in the Congo. So it's really fascinating that he just sees all these different catastrophes and atrocities in remote places still connected to this English countryside because everything kind of like manifests itself there too. So you can just go anywhere from there. And this is also because of the British Empire and it was everywhere. Although of course the Congo was a Belgian colony, but the atrocities committed there were really horrifying. And um, in the end, I think 20 million people were killed by the colonizers. So it's like a forgotten genocide. At the time, people actually were aware of it. and. Many people criticize it. For instance, like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the Sherlock Holmes writer, and he said it's the most horrific thing that has ever been done, and it has to be made public, it has to be known by every single soul, because it's just so, so, so disgusting. And just to give you an idea of this panoptic style, Zebad in The Rings of Saturn writes about a panorama painting of the Battle of Waterloo, in einer Art Bühnenlandschaft, unmittelbar unterhalb der hölzernen Balustrade, liegen zwischen Baumstümpfen und Strauchwerk lebensgroße Rösser in dem von Blutspuren durchzogenen Sand. Außerdem niedergemachte Infanteristen, Husaren und Chevaulegers mit vor Schmerzen verdrehten oder schon gebrochenen Augen, die Gesichter aus Wachs, die Versatzstücke, das Lederzeug, die Waffen, die Kürasse und die farbenprächtigen, wahrscheinlich mit Seegras, Putzwolle und dergleichen ausgestopften Uniformen. In a kind of stage landscape directly beneath the wooden balustrade, between tree stumps and bushes, life-sized horses lie in the sand streaked with blood, as well as slaughtered infantrymen, hussars, and chevaliers, with eyes twisted and pain already broken, the faces made of wax, the set pieces, the leather goods, the weapons, the cuirasses, and the colorful uniforms probably stuffed with seaweed, clean wool, and the like. So we see again, it's this 360 degree views of a battle scene. It's very hard, of course, to depict these things like simultaneously, but still it gives a very, very clear impression and a vivid impression of the horrors that are happening during battle with all the dead, the wounded, and like even like the horses are dead and everyone is just in agony there. So this is just suffering on a grand scale and, um, this is one of Seabod's achievements as a writer to really put these things into perspective and also connect individual suffering to this suffering on a macro level. He's looking into the abyss of existence itself, into the abyss of civilization, into the abyss of nature, and into the abyss of every single person. And how Seabod does that, I will point out in my next video. So thank you very much for watching, and I see you next time.